Well, hello and welcome to a very special Dividend Cafe. I am actually recording at my apartment here in the city uh, very early on Friday morning and not doing it in the studio at the office because I'm running from here to another place to another place. And and uh, this morning ended up uh, writing a full Dividend Cafe on the whole situation with Russia and Ukraine, as you can imagine. Um, I actually had pre-written about half of a Dividend Cafe for the first time in over a year that I came into a Friday morning with some Dividend Cafe already done, but uh, the topic can wait till next week, uh, as obviously the fog of war has um, uh, become a more significant factor. I can't really tell you what where the market's going to end on the week. I started writing at four o'clock this morning, Eastern time, and futures were down 300 points. I'm recording right now a few hours later and futures are up uh, 75 points. Um, But just if you look at it from where the week opened to where we were as of the last moment the market was open, because I'm still talking within a pre-market Friday time frame, the Dow's down about 850 points on the week, about two and a half percent. Uh, total from the all-time high of the Dow going back to earlier in the year, the Dow's down about 8%. So, you know, if the Dow were down 8% right now and there was nothing going on in Russia, Ukraine, it really wouldn't be particularly newsworthy. The Dow still hasn't even got to a 10% correction. Now, again, the NASDAQ is down about 17% and the S&P also more tech heavy has gotten down about 12%. So, But again, that's clearly not related to the Russia-Ukraine situation per se, as there's more excess valuations and froth that have gotten taken out of some of the shiny object investing, all stuff we've talked about all year long. Um, The Russia-Ukraine situation has absolutely exacerbated market volatility, and I have no reason to believe it won't continue to do so. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Um, I got an awful lot of inquiries as to why the market was down almost a thousand points on Thursday as the news broke that Russia had indeed escalated violent military aggression against Ukraine coming from multiple directions, not really anything targeted about their attacks, um, nothing narrow in the scope. What really appears to be and feels as if is an attempt at occupying a sovereign nation, at a full-on geographical territorial overtaking of another country. Um, And I think, and then people wondered why the market reversed and actually closed up on Thursday in response to this. Well, I put in DividendCafe.com today a chart of the last about dozen military conflicts that has surfaced in, in modern times. And I was fascinated to see And in every one of those, the market dipped on the day of, and in almost all of them, except for one, basically, the market closed that day higher. There is a sort of consistency to a sell the rumor, buy the news, meaning a lot of the pricing of of uncertainty and tension and conflict may have already taken place ahead of time. There is also the sense that with the depth and breadth and sophistication of market actors now, Very few of them are able to price how exactly this should impact the cash flow generation of American-based companies. It's all fair enough. Um, But again, the volatility has been exacerbated, and I don't see any reason why that would stop. And I want to talk more today about where this thing may be going. Because I think when we look at the sanctions, there's a temptation to politicize some of it. Some people may think the sanctions are right size. Some may think they're not nearly strong enough. (coughs) Some may say, for God's sake, don't put any troops on the ground. Others may say, let's go to war. You know, there's different views people are going to have on all this stuff. And a lot of it, it, you, you find in this day and age, tends to be kind of politicized. But what I would like to propose is that where this thing goes with sanctions is kind of going to fill in the gray area that tells us how this ends. Because I do believe that the capacity for certain sanctions primarily just simply develop nations cutting off imports from Russia. Uh, um, You can cut off exports into Russia 
And they are heavily, I put a chart of this too in Dividend Cafe, heavily reliant on NATO-based countries. There's a fair amount they get from China and a fair amount they get from non-NATO, non-China countries. But most of what they bring into their country comes from NATO bloc, including the United States. And obviously, the primary source of their revenue is they're exporting of various agricultural and energy-based commodities. Once you get to a point where you're willing to pull that switch, the, the Russian economy is dead. I mean, decimated. And there is $640 billion of Forex reserves. We have helped to make Russia a richer country than it otherwise would be. Back in the late 90s, they couldn't have withstood an hour of being cut off from the international banking system. They have a little more, more lifeline here now, but it also decapitates their ability to prolong this and utilize resources in any kind of perpetual state. So I think we will know more in the next 24, 48, 72 uh, hours as to what the depth and breadth of sanctions will be and therefore what the cards Putin will be left with to play. And economically, the market response, I think, comes down to, will you get out of these next one, two, three days some de-escalation? I don't think it's too late for that. Civilian casualties are not high enough yet, thank God, and we pray it stays that way. I don't think it will. I pray it will. Civilian casualties are low enough that there are off-ramps available for some de-escalation that is in a lot of economic actors and nation-state actors best, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, is best for those um, entities, excuse me. But de-escalation is very likely not the path that it's headed towards, in which case some form of capitulation. And the question then becomes whose? And so if you end up with a Russian occupation of the Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine, if there is a Russian flag flying above Kiev by three days from now, then um, I suspect markets may like the idea that there's probably some resolution, like, okay, well, Russia's kind of won. And I don't think that markets should like that. I think ultimately the capitulation to where um, a, the NATO bloc countries allow a rogue actor to occupy an uh, independent country has profoundly negative uh, ramifications long term that may not be able to be priced right away, it may not be visible right away, but that would represent a meaningful degradation of the international rules-based order. That is what I'm watching for now, because I don't see a scenario here apart from a de-escalation in the next two to three days that doesn't end with either the Putin regime being effectively over, which could happen with a severe enough sanctions, or uh, capitulation whereby Russia prevails in occupying Ukraine. And in which case, there's a real rewriting of the post-1990 understanding of international order. I'm only going short on the podcast and video here today because of time. I'm begging you to read DividendCafe.com, where a lot of this is unpacked in more depth. There's more charts. There's a bit more economic explanation and historical context. This is the path that we see things on right now. This is the structure and framework in which we're viewing it. And I hope it's helpful for you. I do hope you enjoy your weekend. We pray for the people of Ukraine and you can reach out to us at the Bonson Group with any questions you have anytime. Thank you for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe.